First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today. Work in Aspire Academy is just across the road, but sometimes looks very far away. Uh, so I have no conflicts of interest, except for the fact that I've struggled with my attendance for a little while. And for today, I would just like to talk about how to apply the scientific knowledge we have for attendance in the performance environment and also to demonstrate some uh, novel or new clinical tools to manage them. So I know it's early morning, but let's start with the brainstorming thing. Um, if I had to ask you about one treatment or one question, one therapeutic option in tendinopathy in sport, and you had to only say one single word, what would you say? Okay, okay let's, let's do it a little bit better. I count to three, and you all see the word. I have a software here that detects all the words. Okay, so one, two, go. Okay, my software has detected all this. It's a little bit old version. Uh, so let's say the big one is eccentrics. This is like the super league of the, of the tendons. But the question is, why eccentrics for tendinopathy? And I did a very easy search. I went to PubMed, I entered eccentric and tendon together. And these are the number of publications we get since 1980 till today. So there are two big landmarks. Uh, Stanis, 1986, the first one to mention something related to uh, tendons regarding eccentrics. And then the big one, Alfredson, 98. And after that, tons of papers about eccentrics and tendons and everything. But we already know that it doesn't work in competitive athletes. Not only this study, many studies showing that when you use it, use it during the competitive season, it doesn't seem to work that well. The question is, why? If we go to this review, uh, they reviewed um, many of the eccentric protocols, and what they found is that uh, most of the studies are using three sets of 15 repetitions. Uh, and also most of the studies are done either in sedentary or recreational athletes. Where does this come from, this 3 by 15? Obviously from Alfredson, that his protocol, he used the protocol of three sets of 15, one to twice a day for 12 weeks. But again, if we, if we go to the original study, we find that it was done in 15 recreational runners up to 45 years on average. So the question is, is this 3 by 15 tendon specific? We can apply it in any tendon in the body. Is it level specific? We can apply in recreational runners, in elite runners, in elite athletes. Is it low type specific? Those two guys are jumpers. One of them is jumping around 10, 12, 15 times per competition. The other one is jumping over 100. And obviously, is this sport specific? Is the same a football player than a marathon runner? And the most important thing for me, can you apply this at any moment of the season? Is the same at the beginning of the season than in the competitive phase? So the question is, how do we do with the elite athletes? How do we deal with them? So I just uh, tell you to listen carefully to the next video. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's a time. There's a time. Oh, man. Get, okay, sits. guys, at home. Here it is. Yes. <laughs> we if, if go. Go into the clock. Pull Start. up your clock app, Rafa. <laughs> okay. And we, you know, uh, JB, you. do we have a, we need Wait, a time I got graphic a timer, ourselves. I got a, I got a timer, you're going to have to start on the next okay, one. So I if you're see. joining us at home on US <laughs> Open now, the reason why we all just blacked out for a second and lost our minds is because <laughs> we realized a couple of days into our streaming coverage that Rafa Nadal does these extended wall sits for a very specific period of time before he goes and plays these big matches. And it was something that Nick and Prim had never seen before. And oh, by the way, like get your popcorn out because watching Rafa go through a warm up prim is beyond exciting. He brings uh, so much energy and intensity. Okay, so prim is on it. She's very particular. She knows a lot about 
what he's doing goes it. into he, the warm up session. He's going to so do these for a it. minute. You I started, started it pretty okay, late. So he, okay, went about, so that was 50, he went about 50 he's seconds. Up. He's up. And he's going to do what did he do last time? Okay, so Rafa Nadal is doing wall sits for 45 minutes. This is the coverage of the US Open that he won a couple of days ago. So, uh, of all these things, he's now doing the isometrics. So, eccentrics were the super league of the exercises. Isometrics are the Champions League of the exercises. This is the novel thing. This is what Rafa Nadal does. And this is the most new, trendy exercise to do. If I do something similar to what I did to with eccentric, and I do it with isometrics, I found a slightly different thing. So, nobody talking about isometrics and tendons for a few years. Until 2015, reference paper uh, saying that isometrics induce analgesic uh, effect in tendons. Uh, and after that, it seems that there are a lot of papers talking about isometrics and management of in-season athletes. So, managing tendinopathies uh, during the competitive season. Most of them use the 5 by 45 seconds uh, protocol that the original study uh, did. So, same we did with eccentrics a few years ago. We are repeating again with isometrics, because Rafa Nadal is doing 45 seconds, so everyone should do 45 seconds. So, my question is, is evidence-based our magic recipe? Does that mean that if, if something is written in a paper, we have to replicate with everyone? Aren't we starting to build the house from the roof down? Because we know the basic thing is the progressive loading. Uh, it's been showed for a few years that isometrics are just part of the progression of exercises. And then we have a lot of tools, a lot of things in our bag to be used. But in fact, what we know is that the, the tendon doesn't really care what type of exercise you do, what type of contraction you do. Because apparently the response of the tendon is not because of the type of uh, contraction, it's because of the magnitude of the contraction, because of the strain it causes on the tendon. This study in healthy subjects about ten how tendon adapts says the same. Is that uh, is loading magnitude that plays a key role in tendon adaptation in contrast to muscle contraction type. So I did an another little game. I took a few of the most recent papers on the topic, so managing tendinopathy in competing athletes. I mix them, I put them together, I shake a little bit, and I see what are the most repeated words in all those papers together. This is a real software, not, not like the previous one. So, these are the most used words in all those papers. So, the top five of words is uh, load, pain, above all. Then you get exercise, and then you get athlete, obviously it's about athletes, and active. It's uh, very interesting for me, actually it was very interesting to use this, because it gives you a general idea of what is people talking about. So, then we can go into detail and go uh, to different specific exercises and so on, but these are the important things. And it makes sense, because the current model of tendinopathy, uh, the, um, the continuum model, it's mentioning six times the word load in just this. So it has to be important, obviously. So, talking about load, how much is too much? It's very easy to talk about load, but we never know. We already know uh, that for injuries in general, it means show that it's not how much load you do, it's not overload, otherwise every elite athlete would be injured because you need a lot of uh, load to get to the high level. But it's the way you get to that load, uh, the way you accumulate load versus the spikes you have. And when any sudden change happens, you have more risks to sustain an injury. We all know that, it's quite recent, but it seems to resemble quite well what happens in tendinopathy, that we know it comes from a mismatch between the tendon load capacity and the, tendon, the load you place in the tendon. So it's a little bit like this. I, I can tolerate this, but I get this. 
But on top of this, with competitive athletes, we have all these things changing, uh, which are the competition demands, the coach demands, uh, the circumstances of the competition at that time, uh, the calendar, the expectations. Uh, there are so many factors in competitive sports. And also we have this uh, support team around the athlete, which in general is uh, SNCs and coaches pushing to work harder and medical staff pushing to release the player and give him some rest to recover. So what I did is just a, a quick analysis is uh, the facts we know about tendinopathy, what evidence says, and the facts we know about sports. So one by one, we know that tendons hate changes. So evidence says avoid load spikes, but sports says I need spikes to perform. And sometimes I have to spike for certain competitions. Uh, we cannot change that. Second one, tendon, tendons like heavy loads, but they progress very slowly. So the evidence says progress slowly. And the sport says we have no time. Third one, tendons are very sensitive to compression. And we know we have to avoid compression. But in certain sports, it's impossible to do it. Uh, we know the full knee flexion causes compression in the quadriceps tendon, but we cannot avoid full knee flexion in a weightlifter. So we cannot change that. Uh, we know the kinetic chain is usually impaired in tendinopathy, so we know we have to address the whole kinetic chain, but in sport is like in some sports, coach will tell you, I don't really care the quality of the movement as soon as he scores a goal. So do whatever you want. Uh, also, we know that we cannot rely on pain in tendinopathy because it's not the best predictor. Um, but it's true that athletes are used to deal with pain and they are used to play with some kind of pain, sometimes with too much pain, and sometimes they will hide the pain just because they want to play. So it, if it's not reliable in tendinopathy, it's even less in sports. And the last one is that we know that in tendon, pain improves with activity and worsens 24, 48 hours later. So the evidence says observe, observe the, beha the behavior and adjust the loads. But the coach will tell you, look, I have 24 players. I cannot be adjusting the load for every single player. And by the way, we have a match in two days. So this is what we have. And this is what the coach tells you at the end. It's like, OK, thank you very much for all your information. But can he play this weekend or not? So the question is, how should we do it? We have some key characteristics of tendon in sport, which is tendinopathy, uh, sorry, pain, inhibition, altered motor pattern, and weakness. All these relate to each other, and we can address them on different ways. So we can address pain with medication, isometrics. We can address muscle inhibition with pre- and post-activation exercises. We can address weakness with our progressive strength protocols. And we can address the whole kinetic chain. It seems that all depends on strength and keep playing. But we have some short-term things, so we can easily address, let's say easily, address pain and inhibition in the short term for the next weekend, for the next two weeks. Uh, but the other part of the, of the puzzle, it takes a long time, and athletes need to know. So because of this, we have some common mistakes. These are the typical things we sometimes say to the athletes. It's like, let's take a rest until you feel better, and then we'll start. So that will cause deconditioning. Second one is, uh, you have pain, so great, let's start with eccentrics as soon as possible. So you will irritate the tendon, for sure. Third one is, uh, let's decrease your training load this week uh, so that you can play the match ne next weekend. So this is a short-term gain for a long-term pain, because uh, if you do that, you will keep deconditioning. If you don't train during the week to play the match, actually what you are creating is a bigger spike. You decrease the load this week to do the match in the weekend, and the next week will be the same, and the next the same. Um, next one is, we'll give you some medication so that you don't have to stop. Great for the short-term, but what about the long-term? Uh, next one is, 
keep training and just stop if you feel something. That never happens because usually tendons are not painful once you are warm. Uh, the other one is, how do you feel? A uh, couple of minutes later, now, and next day, and now. So tendons progress very slowly. So we cannot create the expectation to the athlete that by doing these exercises in two days, he will feel much better. I usually tell them, uh, seeing a tendon evolution is like watching your son growing up. You cannot be looking at him every single day because he will not grow up day to day. You have to compare with two weeks ago, with two months ago, with two years ago. Next one, we'll inject whatever and you will be back in whatever days and weeks. Obviously, this, no comment. And then the last one is, uh, don't worry, tendons never break. Uh, don't say that. <laughs> I, I've known a couple of cases that the doctor just saw, uh, said that the same day they broke up. So my process is uh, three steps. First one is identify the individual injury triggering factors for this athlete you have. The second one is quantify your training load and your exercises load. And the third one is monitor overtime. So let's start with identifying. The triggering factors in tendinopathy are about, let's say, two big factors. One is ex excessive load, and the second one is decreased tendon tolerance. Let's say everything more or less falls into one of those two. So in terms of load, it can be many things. The volume, the intensity, the compression, the surface, uh, the training program, many things. In terms of, of decreased tendon tolerance, we have a lot of things that we know that influence the tendon tolerance apart from detraining and off-season, which is one of the most typical ones. We have some medications like fluoroquinolones, we have some metabolic disorders, we have some alter, uh, alteration in the biomechanics of that athlete. But the reality is that most of the times are both things together. You don't only have one factor. And most of the times it's not excessive load, it's just the changes in load. So let's get some examples. Uh, we have this uh, distance athlete, and this is his running volume, monthly volume for the 17-18 season. Uh, he got an Achilles tendinopathy twice that year. So here and here. And if we see, it's very easy to know that after a month he stopped because of different circumstances, he got tendinopathy after, so easy off-season or uh, rest causes problems for this athlete. But if instead of looking at one year, one season, we look at two seasons, this is the comparison of what he did the previous season compared to that season. So actually the problem is much bigger. It's not about stopping one month. It's coming from doing almost 500 kilometers per month to do 100 kilometers per month. So this is the reason behind all this. So lesson one, look at the bigger picture, always. And if we go to the same picture, we would say, what are the problems for this guy? So a little bit of those three things. So the off-season, the uh, detraining, plus the volume problem and the training error. So why is this important to me? Because I, I always have this in mind, and I try to look for the important factor and if the important factor is over there, so it has to be managed more with training than with something else. If the factor is over here, I think more of the tendon itself. Both cases, I will deal with the two things. But it's important for me to know more or less what's the problem. And then I introduce you to Mr. Tendon. He's a 400 meters hurdles guy, uh, which is called Mr. Tendon because since 1999 to 2019, he had these episodes of different time loss injuries in different tendons. And this is the typical thing about horses and zebras. So obviously he's an elite athlete. It's about sport. But in this case, we know there are some metabolic disorders that influence tendinopathy. It's not the most typical thing. But I realized a few years after that he is always constantly having problems in the blood test with these two things, with the, the 
triglycerides uh, and the HDL constantly. Every blood test, every doctor is like, you have to take care of your uh, food, be careful, blah, blah, blah. After a few years, I realized and I said, maybe these are not horses and are zebras. So uh, the lesson is, is not only about load, is the less of the cases are like this, but sometimes it happens. And th the big thing is when you have a guy with 20 something episodes of tendons, maybe there's something. So in his case, I know it's on this side, but for many years I thought it was on the other side. So we were blaming the footwear for the Achilles entesopathy, and we did a lot of things in these years. So basic solutions for compressive problems. So lesson three is compression matters, and we know, but sometimes. And the question that everyone makes me always when I do these uh, kind of presentations is, OK, great, but load is very easy to measure in individual sports like athletics. But what about team sports? Uh, the load factors are much more complex, and there are some technical and tactical things that we cannot interfere, in, interfere we're with. So uh, there are some collective factors. Uh, competitions are much more frequent, and performance is different. You don't measure performance. Uh, you cannot measure how good this guy is just because of the number of goals he scored. So I took one example. He's a handball player. And during a, a season, he had these three different tendinopathies. So if we look at his load, we can see all this. Uh, this here is the, the winter break. So this doesn't mean he had to stop because of anything. This is just a winter break. So he started having the tendino tendinopathy around here. And then he went from Achilles to patellar to supraspinatus and back and so on. If we look at the other player in his position, this is his load. And his big problem was he had one hamstring injury here with two recurrences. And if we compare the load of the two players, this is what we get. So whenever the hamstring injury one is off, the other one is training more. So he's getting overload because of the injury of his teammate. And you would say, OK, easy to solve. Tell the coach, look, this guy is overloaded. We have to be careful. And I can tell you that the, the answer by the coach was uh, great. Do you want to play in that position? Because I only have one guy. <laughs> so he will have to play. So lesson number four is know the context. So once we have identified the, the risk factors for our athlete, Second thing is how to quantify what we are doing. And for me, it's a typical battle be between the, let's say, harmful load for the tendon and the protective load from the exercises or from the rehab. So training load versus rehab load. Training load, let's say, easy to measure or is not our business. Uh, kilometers, volume, uh, GPS data, whatever. And re-upload, we have all the exercises we do for the tendon so that we can say this is the training load a certain athlete has, which should be balanced with the re-up load. So to balance the tendon tolerance with the, uh, with the tendon load. But the problem is, how do we measure re-up load? We are quite good nowadays in measuring training load, but we have no idea how to measure tendon load or re-up load. Most of the times, we are underloading them. 99% of the times, I would say. But sometimes, in a high-level sport, we are overloading them with exercises. Because on, on top of what they are doing, they finish the training and they come with us. And we add our exercises to the gym exercises, to the training, and to everything. So that that load turns into overload. Let's take one example, this exercise. Uh, this is an exercise that uh, all over the world they started calling it uh, Spanish squat, mainly because of one of my mates in the Athletics Federation. He started using it. 
but it's quite interesting how in Spain we call it Russian squat. So you know where it comes from. So let's compare it with this exercise for the tendon. I'm talking about the patellar tendon here. So in terms of load magnitude for that tendon, three sets of 15 in that exercise, how does it equal to in this exercise? Three of 15 with the same weight? Does it equal to four of 20? Two of 27? Does someone know? We, we don't know. I don't know. So the question when I have to choose an exercise for my athlete is which one should I choose? Do I do it two legs, one leg? Do I add extra load? Do I do it slow, fast? How many reps I do? How many sets? Do we do it before training, after training? These are the real questions we get when we are working with the athletes. So there's no protocol for this. Sorry. Let's make the videos work. Yeah. And even within the same exercises, we have many ways to do it and many factors that change the load in the tendon. We have the speed, we have the weight, we have the positions, we have the one leg and two legs, and that changes a lot for the tendon. How can we measure this? In the academy we have, uh, thanks to Phil Graham, I don't know if he's somewhere here, um, we created this biomechanical model to try to estimate the load that the tendon is having while doing these exercises, so that when you change the different angles of the trunk, of the hip, of the knee, it gives you an estimated data of uh, how much load the tendon is tolerating. This was quite interesting because it, it uh, was teaching us how important the positions were to do these exercises and how we can increase the load just by changing the trunk position. But apart from this, what are the factors that make a tendon exercise more demanding than another one? These ones we know, the sets, the reps, the weight, the speed, good. What about all the others? The duration of the exercise, the range of motion you use, the specificity to the tendon, if there's ground contact or not, if you use a kinetic chain or is isolated. So all those are things you have to, to think. So we developed a practical tool for quantifying the the load for these tendon exercises. So that we chose these seven criteria that I consider are relevant for tendon exercises. I might be wrong, but this was just an approximation of, of trying to quantify this. Uh, the kinetic chain implication, the range of movement, the tension in the tendon while you are doing the exercise and the lengthening, the muscle recruitment, the contraction type, the specificity to the tendon of that exercise, and if there's ground contact or not. So according to that, we give zero to three point two different criteria. So let's take again this exercise. And these are all the criteria for any exercise. But I just put here my exercise and I try to give some points. So let's go, I'm not going into detail of everything, but let's go for example to range of movement. So no movement, isometric would be zero points. Uh, one point would be last degrees. M two points would be mid range and three points would be full range. So that for this exercise or for the exercise I, ch I choose, I try to find which one is it. For this exercise, we are using mid range, it's not full range, and like this for every single criteria. So that at the end I get the number of points, which is 14 points out of maximum 22, which is, let's say, 64 out of 100. What does it mean? They are arbitrary units. Uh, that means Every repetition of this exercise will be 64, let's call it tendon load units. So that if he does 10 repetitions, will be 640. If he does 100, uh, 6400. Okay. What I did is I use the uh, I give the points to the 25 most common exercises I use, and I analyzed in the same way so that I can get a point, uh, a number. This exercise, I, uh, we said, it's over there. And I have from the, mo from the easiest exercises to the most demanding exercises. And if I need a more demanding exercise, or if I need to increase the load, I can either do more reps, more sets, and so on of the same exercise, or choose another exercise with, m with more load. Because at the end, this is about the time you have. And this comes from having no time. 
when you get to the certain level, if you want to increase the load, you would need to do a lot of reps, weights, and everything. And this is time consuming, and athletes don't have a lot of time. So this came from the idea of how can I increase the load, decreasing the time, by using exercises with more load. I did the same with Achilles tendon exercises. So for example, this seated calf raise is placed around there, and then you have all of all the other exercises. And this takes us to a monitoring sheet. That is this. So uh, this is what I use on a daily basis to monitor the athletes, so that imagine you have an uh, Achilles problem. So your pain today was five. Okay, and then we'll go to this. This has a lot of calculations behind, but let's say you do the three sets of 15, famous, with uh, 10 kilo of, uh, how can I go there? Yeah. Okay, and you have a, the list, sorry it's in Spanish, this one, but, so let's cho choose any exercise. And one leg. Okay, so it gives you, and based on those calculations for each exercise, it gives you an, an amount of load for these three sets of 15 repetitions of this exercise. So that I can be progressing every day with the amount of exercises I do. So if the day after I do three of 20 with the same kilos of same exercise, I should get more load. And that's the amount of load I get. So that I get this into a chart. And I'm getting daily the pen, which is the, the yellow dot, and the exercises load. OK, this is how we start monitoring. We check what you do, or we register what, do, what you do, and parallel to that, the pain, so that I can correlate the two things. And this is just a evolution. Uh, what exercises we do, how we do them, and so on. This comes later, don't worry. Uh, let's close this. OK. So let's go to the famous Alfredson protocol and see how much would score these three sets of 15 reps. Would be a tendon load of 1,845. If I compare it with, uh, this is a, a, preven a, a exercise program for one of our high jumpers in the academy. And he had a, like, um, like a f uh, standard session for different, different uh, moments of the, of the season. So some warm-ups, some tendon sessions in the gym, some tendon sessions uh, after the sessions. So if I compare that uh, 1800 to any of the sessions he does, even the lowest one, which is the warm-up, is not even there. So as I said, most of the times we are underloading them by doing just three sets of 15. And if you compare with some of the things we do, some sessions are around 300 repetitions. So uh, this is what we need wi when the athlete is really fit and when the athlete is really training. In terms of exercise sele selection, it's like, okay, I, we have a battery of, I have a battery of 25 exercise, but you might have a battery of another 25 or you might only use 10. So which ones do, do we use? So I think it's up to everyone to use whatever you consider is good but I give these three advices. So we have uh, some exercises as warm-up or as pre-training, like Rafa Nadal was doing. For this, uh, it should be uh, isolated exercises. Don't involve the kinetic chain, because we just need to load the tendon at that moment. So for the Achilles, good exercise is the seated calf raise. For the patellar tendon, the leg extension, isometric. Or you can use movement. It doesn't mean it, it has to be only isometric. But for me, it's not about the type of contraction, as we said, but about the magnitude and about the specificity to the tendon. So if you want to warm up the tendon, you have to do a tendon exercise. 
exercises to include in the training program, in the typical progression program that you would do for your standard tendinopathy, I would say. How do you include them in the, in the program? So here we can include exercises that are dynamic, that include the kinetic chain. It doesn't mean we only have to use this. We can combine with isolated exercises. But to integrate with the training program, you have to be careful because uh, it has to match with what he's doing in training, in the gym, and so on. It cannot clash. So I usually say that with these kind of exercises, you have to complement what he's doing in the gym, not repeat it. So depending on the sport, depending on the athlete, you can do different things and adapt. Good thing with the belt is that you can use it anywhere in the world. So that is a very important thing to create adherence to the athlete because he will stick to the program if he can do the exercises anywhere. And at the end, obviously, you can do the sport-specific thing, which is more to the coach. And I also suggest, and this is just a clinical finding based on experience, that whenever they have a, a very hard session, the typical one that they know it's going to be painful the day after. In jumpers, is a jumping session. In endurance can be a long run. Do heavy loads right after the session. Because we found out it's quite good for the pain and for the tendon. So it would be similar concept to the pre-training thing. So isolated exercises. But for activation, you wouldn't need very heavy loads because it's just activation. While after training, heavy loads are quite good. Why does this happen? I don't know. I don't know. But I've seen clinically that it's quite interesting how right after the session, an athlete comes, do some heavy loads, and the day after feels much better. I think it's something to do with inhibition. Is preventing inhibition to happen because of pain? Or I don't know. So after quantifying, the last thing is to monitor them. So the question is, what do we track? What do we follow up? So as if this was an exam, we have four options. Tendon structure, tendon function, tendon function, mechanical properties, or all of the above. Let's start with the tendon structure. Standard thing, ultrasound and MRI. Is this useful to follow up? OK, no big thing. We already know it's not useful. Might be useful as a diagnosis, but it's not as a follow up. And what is recommended is to be guided by the clinical examination and the outcome measures, functional outcome measures by the patient. What about the new things like UTC? We know it's a good adjunct to the diagnosis, and it seems that it can, it can monitor changes in the tendon in response to load. It seems. It's not clear, but let's say it could be used. So. If you remember this paper done here, not so long ago, hamstring injuries and predicting return to play, bye-bye MRI, I'm suggesting a new one. It's tendon injuries and predicting return to play, don't count on ultrasound. It's good, eh? <laughs> For not being an English speaker, not so bad. So can we rely on tendon structure to follow up? Mm, not that much. What about tendon function? Important thing here is I always say, how do you measure tendon function or tendon exercise? Are you able to isolate the tendon? Because I think the tendon belongs to a much bigger thing. So sometimes we think we are doing an exercise for a tendon. And you cannot isolate the tendon. So whenever we are measuring function, we are actually measuring the related muscle strength we are measuring the kinetic chain. We are measuring the reactive strength. We are, me we are looking at the quality of movement. I think those are the things we have to look at. The progression from a single leg squat to a hop to a deep single leg squat. Then we get the hop for distance. Okay, And then we get the functional questionnaires which is like trying to gather all this together. I mean, tendon, the gold standard is the visa questionnaire, for A for Achilles, P for, for patellar. But when you look at the questionnaire, because I used it at the beginning, I found out that for sedentary people, it's quite good. Or for 
recreational athletes is good, but for elite athletes, it has one question that is not good and is changing everything. So the last question is, if you have pain while undertaking sports, but it does not stop you from completing your training, for how long can you practice? So the options are nothing, 1 to 10 minutes, 11 to 20, 20 to 30, or more than 30. Is this relevant in sports like sprinting, weightlifting? Because this is what the question that usually the athlete makes you. It's like, how many minutes I train? What do you mean? Including warm-up of specific training since I start until I finish? What does it mean? Because sprinter, effective, effective time of running, probably would never get an, above a minute. And the difference in points is from 4 to 20. So that changes the outcome of, of the questionnaire. So be careful with using this with uh, elite athletes or explain them very well this question. Because for long distance, it's easy. I can run 10 minutes or more than 30, but it doesn't apply to every sport. So what we know it's working is to ask for the pain while doing functional tasks that are demanding for that tendon and monitor it daily, so that for Achilles is the heel raise or the hop, for patellar tendon is the decline squat or the single leg jump, for hamstring is the bridge or the deadlift, and for gluteus is the single leg stand or the hop, so that they can do that. How much pain do you feel? And you can monitor that every day. That's quite reliable. So tendon function, can we track it? Yes. What about the tendon mechanical properties? Because, as we said before, uh, tendons don't care about the type of contraction you do. They care more about the um, amount, the, the magnitude of the load. So we know tendon strain is one big thing in tendinopathy. This is a strain, blue dots is a healthy subject, healthy tendons. Orange ones are the tendinopathy ones. So strain is much more in the, in the um, affected tendons. So we know also that tracking the strain, sorry, in response to the load by the rehab, strain is changing. So what if instead of measuring the tendon structure, the function or whatever, we just measure the strain and we can see if strain is better this month compared to last month. Can we do this? I don't know. I'm not an expert on this. But apparently, recently, this is 2019, with sono elastography, even apparently with a plain ultrasound, you can somehow measure tendon strain. How reliable it is? Uh, how, how many times can you repeat it? I, is there an intra and inter-tester variability? I don't know. But I think that would be a good way of uh, knowing if the tendon is improving or not. Because maybe the improvements we see that we don't see on images are on the mechanical properties of, of the tendon. So looks promising. Last option is all of the above. What if we monitor everything? So I, I'm going to put this, this example. If I want to monitor if you are losing weight, what do I have to check? First is what you eat. Second is how much exercise you do. Then your habits, if you sleep, if you take care of yourself, and so on. If you're taking any medication on top of this. And then you have to go on the scale and see what your weight is. And then we have put to put a time frame. And the thing is to keep the balance between all these things. So if we go to the tendon, we get what we call the harmful load, so the training load the protective load, so our rehab load magnitude, other things like the surface, the shoes, the sleep, whatever, can be relevant. And then we get the pain and function, as we just said, with the daily pain or the mechanical properties or the kinetic chain function, whatever. So that we have like the dose to the tendon and the response. This is one way of looking at it. It's like what's happening in the tendon and how it is responding. So how much you are eating, how much you are exercising, but at the end the outcome is your weight. So going back to Mr. Tendon, 
This is his one of his last ones. Uh, Achilles tendinopathy, 1718, uh, starting in March, I, if I remember well, going to June. So this is his daily pain in the morning uh, single leg calf race. As you can see, it didn't change. It was from six to eight the whole time. So he was in the red zone, orange to red zone. We would say he cannot compete. But what if we look at his training load compared to this? So this is his pain, red, and this is his training, athletics load. So we can see that he was able to train, and actually he was able to compete with a 7 out of 10 pain. As I know the case, and I know the factor, main factor is not load, is his tendon, uh, we know, and he, mainly he knows, he can tolerate pain with high loads, but he just has to progress slowly. Uh, so I usually say you have two ways of progress. You can have less pain doing the same, or you can have the same pain doing more. Some cases, we don't have to focus on pain, as I said before, but on function. So if you have pain seven, eight at the beginning, doing almost nothing, and you have same pain at the end, doing high loads and track, then you have improved. Then the case of one of our high jumpers, in general, I, I will explain, blue is our tendon load, it's not training load, it's the exercises he's doing with us as a prevention, as a pre-ab. Uh, the yellow dots are pain on the knees, one is left, one is right. These uh, bars are jumping sessions because we found out that this, this is a triggering factor every time he does a specific jumps session. And the red ones are the competitions. So I could start explaining a lot of things about this season, this is a whole season, but I, I, want to, I want you to start thinking on the other way around. It's like, this is great when I come to the Tuesday lecture and I explain how well we work, but what about when you are there, when you are in October, and you don't know how the graph is going to be at the end? You need to have something in mind, you need to plan, and it can go well, it can go wrong. So my plan over there was that, okay, we were quite stable in the exercises we were doing. He was doing well, let's say, beginning of the season four pain, then easily went to one zero, which is good, nothing. He can train normally, no problem. Uh, but knowing he had a big and important competition around this time, around February, I have to start thinking, how do I want to do? Because if I remain with the same exercises load, and his training load is increasing, at one point, he will start having problems. So my idea is, let's increase the tendon exercises just until before the competition phase, and then we'll decrease, uh, as you would do with any training. The reality was a little bit different, because, okay, we started increasing, but at one point, he started jumping very often, because the priority here is jumping not doing my exercises, uh, so that we couldn't do that much. And when we got to the competition season, uh, as I had planned, well, let's say we stopped the exercises. But the athlete himself was reporting, it was uh, somewhere else, I, I think in, in Slovakia or something, I remember him calling me around in between these competitions saying, are you sure I don't need to do exercises? I said, no, no, yes recover and so on, do some isometrics if you want, but nothing, don't overload it. When he finished, actually uh, towards the end of these competitions, he started feeling pain and he was reporting to me, look, I, I think we need to do exercises in between competitions. Okay, then let's do exercises in between competitions. I don't know why, but if you are reporting that, you feel you need it, then we'll do it. So let's plan for the next competitive season and let's do it the other way. Instead of decreasing the load during the competition, I will remain. So, this is what happened. Okay, we were able to increase the load quite decently. And when we got to this competition phase, he was, he couldn't do here because of other reasons. That's another fact in competitive sports. One thing is what you plan, but other thing is what you can do. Maybe he comes that day, he's very tired, he cannot do it, he doesn't have time, he has to go to anti-doping control, whatever. You cannot control that. 
So whatever happening will be happening. But it's interesting that the, of the whole season, the highest load of exercises, the highest bunch of exercises, if you remember that table we had, the highest mm, session was 13,000, I think. So in between the last two competitions, he almost reached 20,000. So that means he spent a lot of time doing heavy exercises. And uh, he was reporting feeling much better, not only in terms of pain, but in terms of function. So he was saying that the, inhibi he, the inhibition thing is that he was, what he reports is he can feel the knee, he can feel the power, while when he feels some pain or doesn't feel great, he cannot push 100%. So my lesson from this is fail and learn. Every athlete is totally different. Have some concepts, but be able to adapt. So finally, some lessons for, from experience. To deal with acute tendinopathies, uh, first find the uh, inciting event and manage training. If possible, don't stop, but some rest might be needed at the beginning. So manage with medication and isometric or slow exercises, focus on the tendon. An eccentric in this phase might irritate the tendon. In the subacute uh, tendinopathies, the ones that are not from yesterday, try to avoid detraining and address the strength and the mechanical deficits and try to progress slowly if you can, but look at the bigger picture. And in the chronic cases, these are the easy ones. If it's a chronic case, he cannot run, he cannot do anything, then it's good. We can progress from the very beginning with all the whole progression if we don't have pressure for him to play tomorrow. And some others, is like if the athlete sees training, uh, just focus on specific isolated tendon exercises because all the other ones he is already doing in training. Sometimes they've done over 100 jumps in the training. They come to the clinic and you start thinking you have to progress with the reactive strength and so on because this is what you have to do at that time. So never forget if they are training, they are doing almost everything. You just have to add what you, they are not doing. Then tendon adaptation needs very high loads. So don't be afraid of adding weights and combine different speeds and load at different uh, later stages. And this is a personal opinion. Uh, patellar tendon needs and tolerates very high loads while Achilles high loads in terms of exercises. I mean, Achilles usually reaches a point in which you cannot load it more. Otherwise, you are overloading the calf. So it's better to manage with the uh, training. And what I told you before, we found that high loads post hard training usually imp improves uh, the function in the tendon the day after. And this has been found in several cases. Can I add something else? Medication, injections, other treatments? I'm not going into detail. As long as you do what you have to do, which is load management, the exercises, and the load capacity, do whatever you want. It will add the 1%. But the important thing is you do the 80%. So I'm sorry for not giving you a, reci a recipe book, but I've given you a blender. So you can put all this together, and usually milkshakes are very good in sport also for this. So thank you very much. <laughs>